large overview of fungal infections and we're going to tackle this from things we get from the soil to immunosuppressed fungal infections, the yeast and the molds. Uh, the reason it's important to know more than just Canada and Aspergillus which are sort of leveling off or decreasing is the non-Aspergillus Canada deaths are actually on the increase which is the green line there surpassing the other uh, fungal infections. Now um, for your uh, question Emma this person uh, was walking barefooted cut their foot on something in the soil healthy person 28 and for the next nine years gets progressive swelling of the foot and it's now got sinus tracts draining a gritty sulfur granule material and she wanted it amputated so we amputated it off cut it down the middle and you can see the infection is infiltrating the bones the joints and uh, the sulfur granule was here meeting the white cells and there's the splendor hopefully phenomenon where the white cells meet the edge of the sulfur granule and there's the projection so this would likely be what infection what's the clinical name and the microbiological name so this is mycetoma also called what kind of foot Madura foot okay and it's either a actinomyces streptomyces nocardia or it's one of the fungi and for your infectious boards what fungus is the most common cause in the southeast United States right pseudalisheria also known as cetosporium apiospermium okay so if it's a fungus you give them either itra voriposa if it's a bacterial you give them antibiotics okay so this sort of summarizes everything that we have just said and traumatic inoculation more in males than females 20 to 50 year age great surgery antibiotics itra voriposa if it's a mold okay for your uh, question, Deep T, we got lumpy jaw draining, gritty, sandy material. So, close, modified acid fast negative. Actinomycosis. So, here's your sulfur granule. There's the gram positive filament, this rod. It's called actinomycosis, but it's not a mycosis. It's not a fungus. It's a misnomer because of those filamentous rods. There's the molar tooth colonies. So lumpy jaw, gram positive filamentous, modified acid fast negative, nocardia is positive, sulfur granules, molar tooth colonies. It's usually polymicrobial, so you got to treat other bugs that are associated. Penicillins, doxy, surgery, usually the drug of choice. And then for your uh, question, Simon, What's it called when you have a pseudomycetoma, usually staph or pseudomonas? It looks like a sulfur granule, traumatic inoculation, and there's the gram positive cocci of staph aureus. This is called blank. Botryomycosis. So botryomycosis is a bacterial pseudomycetoma resemble sulfur granules, staph and pseudomonas, aberrant granulomatous response to a infection from staph and pseudomonas, and the groups are diabetes, HIV, and cystic fibrosis. Okay, we got um, a cauliflower growth here. Um, Jean-Pierre, what is this? Okay, here's all your clues. Traumatic inoculation, very verrucous, very cauliflower looking, working up the leg, very uh, invasive here over years. Sometimes it's hyperpigmented. This was a patient we had that had it for three years on his arm, come and go. Here's the pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia, which means the epidermis is going way down into the dermis. There's the microabscess. And this is the classic medlar bodies, copper pennies. So this has to be nothing other than chromoblastomycosis. Okay, this is the chromoblastomycosis look-alike named after Dr. Leboi. So this is lobomycosis. And it affects what kind of sea creature? Dolphins die of lobomycosis. Okay, so you can also see it in animals. So back to chromoblastomycosis, chronic subcutaneous mycoses. Remember, this is the clinical diagnosis: traumatic inoculation, 
Remember that term? Because when you see that in a pathology skin biopsy, it usually means fungus, blasto, chromoblasto, pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. Don't forget those classic medlar bodies, sclerotic bodies, copper pennies. Remember the fungus is weird names. Fonsacea, phylophora, cladosporium. Okay, but chromoblasto is the clinical name. Itra, posy, terbinafine, vori. Okay, now this one, Emma, is traumatic inoculation, healthy person working in their yard, and the biopsy shows a pigmented mold with septations called a dematiaceous mold. So this is what kind of fungus? Right, a phaohyphomycosis, and with itraconazole, it shrank down to um, a quarter of the size in just three weeks. Okay, so that's phaohyphomycosis is the clinical diagnosis. And then look at the uh, micro curvularia alternaria, cetosporium prolificans. These are the dark pigmented and dematiaceous molds. Phaohyphomycosis is another form of a chronic sub-Q my mycosis, traumatic inoculation, dematiaceous, dark-walled, septate hyphae, and here's all the bugs listed in order there, okay? All right, same drugs, the azoles. Okay, uh, Becky, we've got someone working in the garden, gets a puncture from a rose thorn or an orange or sphagnum moss, and now it's working up their arm. So this is none other than what? Sporotrichosis, okay, and here is the yeast phase. So this is the first of the dimorphic fungi. Uh, these are the cigar bodies or box cars in the intracellular. And then when you grow it in culture, this is the mold phase of sporotrichosis. Now this looks very verrucous, but when you look up his legs, notice the proximal extension. Sometimes it's just a big ulcer. In AIDS patients, it presents as dissemination all over the skin, also is in the lungs. Don't forget those cigar bodies because that's how they're going to diagnose it on histopathology as well as culture. And then Sally, um, when the patient says, I don't have $1,500 for itraconazole, you can give them something that costs 10 bucks, but you have to be very careful because it's toxic and what is that? Potassium iodine, okay? So itraconazole is usually the drug of choice. So remember, it's Sporothrix shankii. Uh, it has actually been associated with a squirrel bite or crawling under your house and bumping against the wood. Anything that can cause a little bit of trauma because it's in, in the environment. The differential includes nocardia, mycobacterium, tularemia, and leishmania. Those are the lymphocutaneous nodular lesions, okay? So you have to think of the other ones as well. It can cause a pneumonia and it can disseminate, especially in immunosuppressed patients. Um, but we usually think of it as skin and soft tissue infection. And you want to look for those uh, boxcar looking bodies, okay? All right. The treatment is itraconazole and then really bad cases, amphobe or potassium iodide. Okay, um, Emma, we've got papules, pustules on a CLL patient, only on the legs, but could be a few spots every other place. Sometimes they're centrally umbilicated, and then the biopsy gives away the answer. It's a pinched or narrow base bud, so this has to be what fungus that has a capsule that you can clearly see on India ink. Pinched bud. So this is cryptococcus and she had primary cutaneous cryptococcosis. Her CSF was negative and so she inhaled it and it disseminated. But notice the pinched or narrow base bud of crypto. There's the capsule around it. If it does not have a capsule, what test will be negative? the crypto antigen so you have to have a capsule to have a positive crypto antigen what's the chances Sally that this cryptococcoma is going to have a positive blood test for cryptococcal antigen zero thank you so you um, will not have a crypto antigen positive test with a cryptococcoma the treatment is surgical resection to rule out lung cancer or fluconazole for one year rarely watching it 
these are all cryptococcomas. Healthy people can have cryptococcomas, okay? You don't have to be immune suppressed. Now, when it goes to the meningitis, they're usually immune suppressed, but you can be healthy and get crypto meningitis. And how do we put, prevent um, hydrocephalus and AIDS patients that have crypto meningitis? Serial taps. Shunt is when they already have hydrocephalus. How do we do it in a non-AIDS patient? We give them steroids, corticosteroids. The drug of choice, Becky, for crypto meningitis is a combination of two drugs. Can you name them? That's enterococcus. Ampho B and 5-flucytosine, right? Crypto, Ampho B, 5-flucytosine, followed by fluconazole. There have been case reports of voriconazole. Why do we like voriconazole over POSA? Better CNS penetration. Good. Okay, um, remember, crypto can go to anywhere in your body, and it can look like a molluscum-like skin lesion. Okay? The crypto antigen false positives. Can you name the two false positives? This is a misspelling. It is not trichophyton. It is trichosporin bagelii can give you a false positive crypto antigen, and so can capnocyte aphasia canemorsis. Okay? So remember those false positive crypto antigens. There's the drugs of choice down there, right? Okay. So AIDS patients, chronic steroids, transplants, those are all key. Okay, Emma, you go into a cave. What are the two infections associated with caves? Bats can give you rabies, and then the bird droppings can give you a hypersensitivity pneumonitis due to what found in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky histoplasmosis right so here's all the birds demonstrating lots of stool coming down okay and then this is the hypersensitivity pneumonitis okay <laughs> so that's a hypersensitivity pneumonitis treat it with steroids you forgot to look for the sign caution this place has histo in it okay so acute histo is more of a inflammatory you can get um, arthritis tenosynovitis pericarditis adenopathy now histo loves the mouth the nose so lesions around the mouth nose the cat scan or x-ray is non-specific you can get ulcers any part of your body now this person bends over and passes out at the age of 18 so what did histo do to them fibrosing mediastinitis. This x-ray looks normal, but if you look closely, there's a nitinol stent in the superior vena cava due to fibrosing mediastinitis, and here's your superior vena cava. So what happens is the histo is very antigenic. It gets into the lymph nodes, and it could obstruct your superior vena cava, or it could obstruct your main stem bronchus, shortness of breath wheezing, or it could obstruct your esophagus dysphagia dynophagia. The treatment is itraconazole and prednisone when it's in the large inflammatory state, but once it's fibrotic, there's nothing to do but stint it. So you want to catch it early. Remember, number one cause of fibrosing mediastinitis, histo, number two, TB, number three, Hodgkin's, right? And then for our pharmacist, what causes retroperitoneal fibrosis? Methysergide, probably not on the uh, list of drugs anymore. But uh, remember, drugs can cause fibrosis in strange places. Okay? So a uh, very calcified, miliary looking histo, common. There's a histoplasmoma, and it could resemble almost anything, but it loves to cavitate. AIDS patients with disseminated histo. So, Emma, what test could you do besides a skin biopsy and a blood culture to find the histo? Where's the mother load of histo going to be? What can you biopsy? The bone marrow. Now, they only biopsy spleens in third world countries, and it's a pretty good test. But in the United States, nobody will biopsy a spleen because they're worried about someone bleeding to death. But a spleen biopsy is supposedly safe, they claim, okay? But the bone marrow biopsy will give you the answer. This is all disseminated uh, histo. Here's the skin biopsy. There's the yeast in different um, stages of development, different shapes, and they're tiny. They tend to be small. There's nothing other, otherwise characteristic about histo. This is a, 
a special silver stain demonstrating it. Here's it in the peripheral blood in a monocyte histo. Here's it in the liver with a big granuloma with histo in it. And then here's histo. Remember your differential of retinitis. So what's your differential of uh, retinitis? Histo, CMV, herpes zoster, and toxo, right? And then one more we had syphilis. So don't forget that one, okay? Okay, so disseminated histo, you can have pancytopenia, HIV, you know. Here's the area where you see it, Mississippi, Ohio River Valley area. And then here's ground zero where you see a lot of histo, okay? Now, um, the diagnosis is histopathology with the culture. The histoantigen is okay, but, you know, depends on where you're at. The treatment is either ITRA or AMFO, depending on how severe it is. Usually for three months is the usual treatment regimen. Okay, a second fungus. By the way, histo is dimorphic. It grows in the yeast and the mold phase. Another fungus likes your nose and lips and um, can look like a cancer, ulcerate, or verrucous, 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 or ulcer, any part of your body. Now this one loves the hilum. You get big old hilum lesions and the peripheral lesions look like cannonballs. So they call them cannonball looking lesions. And this one has a broad base bud, John. What's that? blastomycosis. So easy to remember, they all begin with the letter B. Broad base bud blasto, right? Okay, so blastomycosis. Notice the broad base bud opposite of crypto. Notice the nose lesions, the hyalur fullness, the cannonball lesions. And the treatment of blasto is usually itraconazole or amphob. You can have acute chronic cavitary. And then where does it like to go, Sally? bones. So osteomyelitis with dissemination occurs 25% of the time. It also likes weird places like the prostate, uh, rarely because it goes to the central nervous system. And then the diagnosis is by culture in the histopathology primarily. The treatment is usually itraampho more so than fluconazole. Now histo goes the same places, um, or blasto, same place as histo, but further out up to the north Canada and further east. Okay, so that's Blasto country. Now, um, Emma, we're out in the southwest in the desert where the soil is very acidic. We've got a nose lesion. We've got a spherule with endospores. So that should be coccidioidomycosis or valley fever. It's the number one fungus that'll give you this rash, which is erythema multiform, but can also give you enodosum, okay? So coxy is uh, very classic for that. Now, um, what's characteristic about coxy? Not all the time, but it tends to give you a thin walled cavity, very thin walled cavity. Um, and then these thin walled cavities, you want to think of coxy, but it could look like anything. And then these are the rashes associated with coxy. Now, uh, you have to know the ethnic groups that are, tend to have more severe disease are the African American, Hispanic, American Indian, Filipino, Oriental. Uh, that also has histo uh, or coxy. Coxy meningitis is a bad news thing. It's very hard to cure that. There's some case reports with vorconazole lifelong. Here's a strange market called the coxy market. <laughs> Um, and then here's the coxie out southwest with a few isolated cases in New York State, okay? And this is the classic spherule with endospores, okay? It's also a dimorphic yeast and mold phase, okay? So the spherules histopath and it grows rapidly on the culture, except you want to make sure you tell the lab because it can be spread to the lab personnel and they can easily inhale it and get valley fever, okay? And then, yes, it can disseminate in the immunosuppressed patient. Okay, another lesion that likes your face and nose and mouth, but can go to any organ of your body. This one has multiple daughter cells coming out, so it looks like a pilot's wheel, and it's found deep in Central America, Mexico, and it's dimorphic yeast and mold phase. 
So that's paracoxy. So paracoxidioidomycosis, you want to think about that, okay? And it can resemble tuberculosis. Histopath is the key with culture. Look at those daughter cells, lots of them coming off. Itra ampho are the key ones. So that's paracoxidioidomycosis, and it's Brasiliensis is usually. Okay, so uh, Becky, what fungus is this in the gluteal cleft with satellite lesions? Emma, that's Canada. Satellite lesions equals Canada intertrigo. Canada intertrigo. Canada in the armpit. So anywhere skin opposes skin, you want to think of um, Canada, right? All right, Amrita, what is um, this? cracks at the angles of the mouth called due to Canada. It's called angular chelitis, right? Angular chelitis. And what's the French word for this, Jean-Pierre? <laughs> it's perlèche, okay? <laughs> also known as perlèche, okay? So this is perlèche angular chelitis, okay? That's Canada. It likes the angles of the mouth. Here's the uh, Canada can give you a red erythematous or it can give you the um, white membrane, okay? So this is all Canada. So Emma, if someone has white stuff on that lateral edge of their mouth and it doesn't scrape off like Canada and their HIV positive was a C before a 200, that's what? Oral hairy leukoplakia due to Epstein Barr virus. When Canada disseminates, notice the uh, papular lesions that are less than a centimeter in size, usually pink to red. Notice the dissemination. There's the fungus interest in the vessel. It gives you cotton wool exudates when it goes to your retina, and that's uh, the cotton ball exudates. Remember, tropicalis likes to go to the muscles. In Canada, it can go to any organ of your body. Okay, Remember those cutaneous lesions, half to one centimeter in size. And remember, Canada immortality is higher than VRE, Pseudomonas, or MRSA, up to 40%. Pulling out the central lines may help you to sterilize the blood sooner with Canada. And parapsilosis in this study had the lowest mortality with Cruzii, the highest. So fungus questions for 25. Deep tea, which Canada is resistant to Ampho B, named after a ship that sank in World War I and started the United States into the war? A, um, right, the Lusitania. Very good. Uh, which yeast non-Canada is resistant to Ampho B, Sally? Trichosporin bigelii. Very good. Okay, uh, fungus questions. Which two molds are ampho B resistance? Can you name them, Becky? Aspergillus terius and Pseudalisheria boedii. And uh, remember, Fusarium is relatively resistant. Okay, fungus questions for 50. Which Canada likes mussel? Tropicalis, right? Which Canada has the highest mortality in blood? In that one study was Cruzii. Which Canada has the lowest mortality in blood? That one study. Parapsilosis. And for for hundred, which Canada is most common in urine following albicans? Glabrata. And then which Canada is most commonly associated with total parental nutrition? Parapsilosis. And which Canada is known for forming a germ tube? Albicans, finally, okay? So Canada albicans, what is a germ tube? Here's the description of it if you were going to perform it. Here's what it looks like visually. A little pseudo-hyphae coming off in the right media is a germ tube. So um, you're seeing more and more non-albicans Canada, so it's important you know a little bit about each one of those. Go through the risk factors. Many of our patients have four, five, six risk factors, TPN, lines, neutropenia, chemo, other antibiotics, diabetes, etc. Okay, um, notice that the Cruzii has some of the highest MICs to fluconazole and a little bit with glabrata, but notice the echinocandins tend to be pretty well. Some people say parapsilosis isn't as well covered with echinocandins, but others say it's not a big deal. 
Uh, there is some articles that suggest if someone has been on Flucon and they have Glabrata in their blood, there may be cross resistance with Vori. Otherwise, they're pretty much covered there. And then um, here's um, uh, some strange named candidates with very low MICs, again, to the Vori and the Echinocandans. Large vegetation endocarditis, what do you think of? Canada, rarely Aspergillus. What's the other bugs? Group B strep, Haemophilus, and Coxiella burnetti. They are bigger than two centimeters, so large vegetation endocarditis. Uh, Canada and the liver spleen, they call that what? They used to call it hepatosplenic candidiasis, but they realized it also goes to the kidney and the lungs, so we better call it chronic disseminated candidiasis. They need to be treated for six months to a year. It takes you a long time. What percentage have positive blood culture? Less than 50 percent. Probably less than 20 percent. Okay, so low numbers. So don't rely on a blood culture to make this diagnosis. What blood test is going to be elevated with holes in your liver? The alkaline phosphatase. So that's the clue. Plus they got a little pain in their right upper quadrant and maybe their left upper quadrant. If you biopsy this, it's very hard to see the yeast and it almost never grows in culture. So biopsy in is not a favorite tactic. It's a clinical diagnosis. Candida pneumonia almost never exists except in rare cases where it's truly disseminated, showing up as nodules there. So remember, the ALK phosphatase is the key to focus on plus the CAT scan. Remember, Canada can go basically any part of your body. You can name any organ and Canada can wind up there. Okay, So you could look that up. Now, this kid has a defect in trying to get rid of Canada. He needs to be on fluconazole lifelong. So what does he have? Chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, which is under the heading of chronic granulomatous disease, so they have a myeloperoxidase problem clearing Canada. Okay, which fungus is this, Emma, with a scallop border and central clearing? So that's tinea, so that's a dermatophyte. What is a dermatophyte, Simon, with an aberrant granulomatous response, usually found in your beard or your hair? It gets very boggy. It may get secondarily infected. Those are the bugs. I need the clinical diagnosis. A carry-on, not a carry-on like on the airplane, but a carry-on, K-E-R-I-O-N. Carry-on, dermatophyte, hair follicles, hypersensitivity, aberrant immune response, may have secondary bacterial infections, boggy, purulent, and it's more common in the African race. You can use griseofulvin for kids and all the other antifungals, itraflucon. Okay, this is such a weird looking rash. What fungus gives you a bunch of concentric rings or bullseyes? Tinea imbricata, and if you were going to name this, this is a good name, Trichophytrin concentricum. Okay, so that's um, dermatophyte infection, tropics, concentric rings, bullseye. Now, we'll get really hard here. What are the top three dermatophytes? Name one. Okay, trichophyte and rubrum. Microsporin and epidermophyton, very good. Those are the three dermatophytes, okay? Uh, what's this one, Emma? Tinea pedis, right? This one is, that's not tinea curris. It's got satellite lesions, so it's canna or trigo. That was a trick question. Okay, this is Tinea curris with the scallop border. This guy's not getting better, John Pierre, on um, antifungals. And so we get out our woods lamp, which gives us the coral pink fluorescence, and we give him azithromycin, and it clears up. So he has erythrasma due to crinibacterium minutissimum. So those are the three groin rashes to remember. What's this called, um, Becky? Onychomycosis, usually dermatophytes are the most common too. Canada and a distant third, molds like fusarium. Good. This one was Canada and a transplant patient. Uh, this guy's in Southeast Asia with HIV and disseminated fungus all over his body. Right, Penicillium marnefii, right? And it also gives you molluscum-like skin lesions just like crypto. 
molluscum-like skin lesions. This is also dimorphic. Here's the yeast phase, and this is the yeast phase, okay, intracellular. There's the mold phase, which is the red pigmented mold, dimorphic fungus endemic in Southeast Asia. Okay, cavitary lesions with a halo around it in a immunosuppressed patient that may cavitate. That one we're familiar with, with the air crescent sign. So that is aspergillus. It tends to cavitate, okay? Classic halo, cavitation, clearing up over time and leaving a little hole in the lung. If you cut it out, there's the dead tissue. There's the artery invasion. And um, if I were to get out my ruler, what's the angle? 45 degree branching septation, okay? So that's the aspergillus, okay? There's what it looks like when you grow it. There's a nice picture of aspergillus. Okay, so the three kinds of aspergillus are allergic bronchopulmonary, that's more itraconazole, prednisone, the fungus ball, usually surgically resected, and then the invasive aspergillus, and occasionally tracheobronchitis, and then it can go to other places. Of course, sinusitis, which fungus likes the sinus more than other aspergilluses? Flavus whereas fumigatus is more in the lungs, okay? And then, of course, it could go to your brain, and this is what it would look like causing the infarcts. It could disseminate with hemorrhagic black necrotic lesions, aspergillus, and this guy, primary cutaneous, requiring amputation. Um, sometimes it can get out of control, and it occurs about after 10 to 14 days of neutropenia and then increases. It's also heavily found in the allogeneic bone marrow transplant who has graft-versus-host disease, acute or chronic, so several uh, months or weeks out of transplant. So the top groups are leukemics, allo, autos, AIDS, transplants, and other solid organ transplants. Lung, brain, skin, sinus. Mortality used to be 60-80%, now it's 10-20%. to 20 And the solid organ transplants also had high mortality until recently with the newer drugs. And yes, it can go to many different places, so you can find it in unusual organs. Histopath culture is the key. Galactoman and beta-glucan, you can maybe follow it. PCR is not up and running. Remember, many people are colonized with HIV, but if there are the high-risk groups and they have it in their sputum, it's either invading or getting redder to invade, and you should treat it accordingly. So the treatment is the ambisomes, able sets, better than Ampho B, less toxic, the Vori, probably outperformed Ampho, the Posa, and then the echinocandins can also be used. Remember, Aspergillus terius is resistant to Ampho B. And that's the famous graph showing you the survival advantage of Vori over Ampho B. Okay, another mold that likes diabetics, ketoacidosis, mucor or, or, or zygomycosis. What's the most common zygomycosis? Rhizopus. What are the three risk factors? So DKA, neutropenia, steroids, iron overload, ferritin over 2000. What angle is this branch? 90 degrees. It looks like a ribbon or moose antlers and no or very few septations. Here it is in a um, colon invading, causing ar uh, necrosis in the artery. Here's the moose antlers of mucor mycosis, and this is what it looks like. All of that's mucor, surgical resection required, okay? And it can get into the sinus and then into the brain. It also can affect the lungs, like in this patient. It gives you a large um, area of consolidation and may give you central clearing, which is the double halo sign, okay? It's different than aspergillus. Don't forget that iron overload. And what's the drug associated with it? Desferoxamine. What drug chelates the iron in such a way that it, it actually keeps the iron away from the mucor and you can use it as an adjunct? That is X-Jade, okay? So that's the opposite of desferoxamine. So X-Jade will chelate the iron, and I don't know the name for that one. So we'll have to look that up. Remember, it can go to any part of your body as well. And there's not, remember, the echinocandins don't work, so it's able set or ambisome plus posa. Vorcon does not work. So remember, what does Vorcon not cover? Zygomycosis. Okay, what mold likes to get in through your toes with your neutropenic?
It disseminates frequently, may have a positive blood culture, much bigger nodules, deeper than Canada. See how it's in the sub Q? And then look at this ballooning hyphae, very characteristic of this fusiform looking fungus with banana shape. So that is fusarium, it's fusiform in shape. Okay? And here it is getting in through the toes and disseminating all over the body uh, from the toes or the toenails. Okay? There it is disseminating. Again, disseminate a fusarium, always in the setting of neutropenia. And then here's what it looks like in the lungs with a one to two centimeter nodule, not those big old mucor or aspergillus nodules. Notice the ballooning hyphae is key there. Okay, here's an article where Vorcon successfully treated a uh, fusarium that went to the brain, got in through the toes on this patient here. So fusarium, remember, you've got to get those toenails off when it's infected, get those deep biopsies, and you want to use either Vori, Posa, plus an Ambisome, uh, Ableset, definitely combo therapies indicated in fusarium. What mold this guy has it disseminated on Amphob is Amphob resistant. This one has a very high mortality in prolonged neutropenics. Cetosporium, it can also be nodular, one to two centimeters. The bad one is prolific hands. There's no real good treatment for it. Uh, it doesn't work for amphos, doesn't work for echinocandins, and apiospermium is a little bit more responsive, also known as Sud Alisheria boedii. Okay, so now we have a lot more fungal drugs on the market to think about and to use in combination. So remember the three classes, the echinocandins, the azoles, and the lipid formulations of Amphob. And remember they work at different mechanisms so we can use combination therapy. Okay, combination therapy, ergosterol and the beta-glucan. Okay, and they have very good activity against all of the molds. Posa and Vori, except of course Posa covers mucor, Vori doesn't. Okay, this looks like a mold infection. Traumatic inoculation, healthy person, granuloma formation, and then you see this strange creature here. It's not a fungus, it's not a virus, it's not a parasite, it's not a bacteria. It's a algae. What's the name of this algae that's treated with Itra, Vori, or Posa? There's your splinter and your granuloma, and there's the algae. So this is protothecosis, correct. There's the algae. So traumatic inoculation, protothecosis, prototheca wicker hami, traumatic inoculation, healthy people, treatment is itra vori posa. Thank you for your attention, and we'll entertain questions.